FinDev Canada fournit du capital de croissance aux entreprises qui ont des pratiques d'affaires responsables et un impact social. L'Institution financière de développement du Canada fournit un financement direct ou indirect à des entreprises durables et inclusives en Amérique latine, dans les Antilles et en Afrique subsaharienne. FinDev Canada a pour mission d'avoir un effet durable dans trois domaines importants. Le renforcement du pouvoir économique des femmes et l'atteinte de l'égalité entre les genres, l'atténuation des changements climatiques et le soutien aux entrepreneurs pour faire croître leurs entreprises et créer des emplois. Le travail de FinDev Canada est guidé par les objectifs de développement durable des Nations unies, à savoir atteindre l'égalité entre les genres, assurer une énergie propre et abordable, promouvoir un travail décent et la croissance économique, favoriser l'innovation dans l'industrie et la construction d'infrastructures et lutter contre les changements climatiques. Nous permettons au secteur privé de collectivement financer des entrepreneurs distingués pour le bien de tous. FinDev Canada, un partenaire de confiance pour la croissance des entreprises inclusives dans une optique de développement durable. Bonjour, hello, good morning, good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. Thank you so much for being with us today. My name is Laurie Kerr and I am the Chief Executive Officer of FinDev Canada, Canada's development finance institution supporting private investment and business growth in developing countries. It is a pleasure to welcome you to this session as part of International Development Week 2022, celebrated by Global Affairs Canada and development partners in Canada and around the world and with all Canadians. This is also FinDev Canada's first webinar of the year. And this is something that we do periodically. And as many of us are working remotely, this is a great way to share what we at FinDev Canada are working on, who we are working with, and the impact that we are collectively having. La session aujourd'hui sera offerte en anglais, mais nous offrons la traduction en français. Pour accéder à la version française des délibérations d'aujourd'hui, veuillez utiliser le bouton interprétation qui apparaît en, bon, uh, en bas de votre écran. Before going any further, as is good practice even in a virtual world, I'd like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you from Montreal, where FinDev Canada's head office is located. We acknowledge that we are on unceded Indigenous lands. The Gagaga Nation, also known as the no Mohawk Nation, is recognized as the custodians of the land and waters here. Jogjoge, or Montreal, is historically known as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations. And indeed, we are going to continue that tradition today with our panelists from around the world, who I'll introduce in, in just a moment. As I mentioned, today's webinar comes to you as part of Canada's International Development Week, a week dedicated to raising awareness of Canada's contributions to international development. And here at FinDev Canada, we support development through the private sector in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Latin America and the Caribbean by providing financing and investment and mobilizing private capital to help achieve the Sustainable Development Goals and Paris Agreement commitments. We are driven by three strategic impact goals, women's economic empowerment, climate action, and market development. Today's session will showcase the important and motivating work of two of our clients, as well as a member of FinDev Canada's Advisory Council. I am particularly excited to be moderating this session today. And with that, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our esteemed panel. And again, an equally warm welcome to all of you who are joining us online. First with us, we have Andrew Johnstone, CEO of Climate Fund Managers. Andrew is joining us from Johannesburg, South Africa. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Laurie. Next, next is Cesar Quenedo Agüelles, CEO of La Cooperación Interamericana para el Financiamiento de Infraestructura, or the Interamerican Corporation for Infrastructure Financing, better known as CIFI. Cesar is joining us from Panama City in Panama. Bienvenido, Cesar. Gracias, Lori. Good morning. And it's a pleasure being here today with you all. Excellent. And finally, certainly not least, we have Joan Larea, CEO of Convergence, the global network for blended finance. Joan is somewhere between Toronto, Canada and Washington, D.C. So thank you so much for joining us today, Joan. My pleasure. Great to be with all of you. 
And we would love you, our audience, to also participate. So I invite you to insert your questions into the Q&A tab. And I'll take them as we go along and, of course, towards the end of the session. But to get us warmed up using the Q&A feature and to test that it is working, may I ask those uh, who are joining us online to put into the Q&A, from which country are you participating today? We have Canada and Quebec. Oh, the UAE, welcome. Lots of Canada, South Africa and France. Canada again, the US. So people from, from all over the world, it's really great to see everyone. Um, over the next hour, we are going to have a discussion about private investment in sustainable infrastructure in emerging markets and developed economies. As a development finance institution, sustainable infrastructure is of particular interest because of the critical climate change angle that infrastructure investment poses, along with the significant development impacts that it can bring. As we know, developing countries, already those most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, remain in great need of additional investment in infrastructure. Infrastructure provides access to basic and essential services such as power and transport and water supply, all critical services to reduce the burden of poverty and to enhance lives and livelihoods. Adding the sustainability lens to how infrastructure is developed and implemented provides a durable climate smart solution to addressing the infrastructure gap and helps developing countries on low carbon climate resilient growth pathways. Also, an important part of that sustainability lens is enhancing gender equality. And our panelists today will offer their perspectives on how they're working with FinDev Canada to address climate and infrastructure challenges with a sustainability lens. So with that, let's begin. The infrastructure we need to meet the goals of poverty reduction and combating climate change requires an additional, an additional annual investment of around 2.5 to 3 trillion US dollars globally. With government budgets under increasing strain only compounded by COVID-19, private investment is needed to bridge the infrastructure investment gap. But let's look more closely at that $3 trillion gap that I just mentioned and examine how it looks in developing countries. The Addis Ababa Action Agenda identified the infrastructure gap as a priority and estimated that one to one and a half trillion US dollar gap in developing countries. And all of our panelists today play a role in addressing that gap, whether by financing projects or advising on how to blend commercial and concessional financing to mobilize private investment and bring important sustainable infrastructure projects to fruition. So with that, let me throw out the first question and I'll start with Andrew of Climate Fund Managers or CFM as we call it. It's really great to see you again, Andrew, and very happy to note that CFM was our second client at FinDev Canada. So in 2018, we invested $20 million in your fund, Climate Investor One. But in fact, CFM has two investment funds focused on the development of renewable energy projects in Asia and Africa, where we find some of the most challenging reasons of regions of the world in terms of poverty, lack of infrastructure, and vulnerability to climate change. And I imagine, Andrew, that you've seen some pretty transformative impacts and effects of these projects. I'm sure the audience would love to hear more about climate fund managers and your two funds. And in answering, would you kindly share what are likely to be uh, some of the impacts of the projects you're developing and particularly in Africa where FinDev Canada's financing is challenged? Over to you, Andrew. Sure, uh, thanks, Laurie. Thanks, thanks for that tee up. Um, great to be here. So as you said, you, um, FinDev Canada was one of our very early investors and that goes back a, a very short five years. So the context really of those big numbers that you alluded to is that all of this needs to happen at an accelerated pace. The climate's not going to wait for us. So we need to come up with new innovative ways of mobilizing and developing and deploying capital at an accelerated scale. That's really what Climate Fund Managers is about. It's a joint venture between the Dutch Development Bank, FMO, and a financial private sector institution called Sanlam, which is Africa's largest non-banking financial institution. And there in and of itself lies an interesting blend of uh, quasi-public sector development financing together with private sector institution coming together um, to deploy capital. That's what Climate Fund Managers does. 
it raises capital into blended finance structures. So your $20 million was a massively important $20 million that then grew into a larger pool of $850 million using blended finance as a technology, which uh, um, I'm sure Joan will speak more to. And we're deploying that money into emerging markets where the, ma where the main impact of climate change is felt. And we're doing it by building real assets. And so we build infrastructure as tangible bricks and mortar and that's where we deploy the assets. So in the doing, we create impact really at two levels. Firstly, the assets themselves. The assets are very catalytic in terms of mitigating climate change, renewable energy, water treatment plants, things that sort of have a positive impact in the battle against climate change. And ancillary to the investments themselves, we do have very active community participation and involvement programs. Um, to give some dimensions to that, you know, um, the um, renewable energy focus is focused around CO2 avoidance. And during the program of Carbon Investor One, which is our first fund directed at renewable energy, we anticipate building um, something in the order of 10, five gigawatts installed capacity, which over the life of the fund will probably create something like 5,000 gigawatt hours of avoided um, uh, or renewable energy, which will manifest in, in the equivalent of about 2 million tons of carbon dioxide avoided. So it, it is quite significant in its impact from a climatic perspective. Um, from a development perspective, those electrons are expected to reach in the order of 13 million people who currently aren't connected to the grid. But also in so doing, we are actively involved in the communities and our involvement is based on a needs-based focused um, sustainable development agenda, which has a lens on sustainable development, education, gender equality, women empowerment, and that's an enduring multi-generational program that's attached to each individual um, investment we make. So through this blended finance, Climate Fund Managers has raised something in the order of one and a half billion dollars, which will equate to a capital expenditure of roughly three times that, four and a half billion, while in itself quite an appreciable sum. It's a small step towards the trillions. And right now, what we're trying to do is create the demonstration effect so there can be 3,000 climate fund managers out there doing what we're doing tomorrow, and then we'll start getting on top of the challenge. Thanks so much, Andrew. Thanks for telling us about climate fund managers and, and the work that you're doing. Um, really appreciated uh, talking about the impact. And we'll invite Joan to speak in a, in a few minutes about blended finance, but that's certainly going to be a, a theme uh, through today. Uh, but before we get to Joan and Cesar, I'd like to turn to you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, your firm, CFI, works in a different geography um, than uh, climate fund managers in Latin America and the Caribbean. And you've been a FinDev Canada client since 2020, and we're super excited excited to support CFI in your journey to invest in green growth projects in the Latin America and the Caribbean region. Very interesting. You structure your investments at CFI around the sustainable development goals. So could you tell us a little bit more about CFI? And as I mentioned in my question to Andrew, can you tell us about the overall impacts that some of your projects are having in the region? Thank you, Laurie. Yeah, very happy to be here. And I enjoy uh, listening to Andrew because, you know, you do very much what we do in another uh, different region, which is Latin America and the Caribbean. So I, I, I completely uh, uh, enjoy the challenges and what you were saying. Uh, Lori, CFI, as you said, is a, is a non-banking private financial institution. We are dedicated to financing infrastructure, infrastructure projects in Latin America and the Caribbean with a strong focus on sustainability and impact. And over the years, our core business model targeted projects that not only foster sustainable development in a region where is highly needed, but also managing risk, managing risk and negative impacts associated with them to ensure a resilient business model. And I think infrastructure is pretty much, pretty much that, a resilient business model with low volatility, stable cash flows, highly structured deals, that uh, make that asset, uh, real assets, very interesting for the investors. So that led us to inu new initiatives in which we aim to create also positive impact with each investment and to contribute to a larger goal such as the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. Okay, so such framework allow us and other stakeholders to work together toward the same uh, positive outcomes and guide our uh, work 
to select projects that help us achieve this. And to give you an idea, our portfolio is now composed 50% of projects related to green energy, wind, solar, geothermal, uh, with an installed capacity close to 700 megawatts through the whole region. So with that, we are avoiding close to uh, 1 million tons of carbon emissions every year. And also, this uh, portfolio provides clean energy to almost 2 million people, and we have created 12,000 jobs. So this is the contribution of CIFI uh, to this green portfolio, and also all the projects that we structure, all the targets that, that we have are related to the SDG. There are some relevance, for instance, uh, one related to clean, clean water and sanitation. We finance, we were the first to finance a clean water project in Brazil. Now, after a couple of years, three years, uh, this project being uh, performing well, they were able to issue green bond. So we, we are sometimes the fear, the first to come to uh, provide that financing to a project that maybe is in the earlier stage and need that push from a lender, from an investor to make that project a reality. And then when they show performance, they can have access to more institutional money as the green bond. So that's also part of what we do in CIFI. Uh, also, uh, gender equality is, uh, is another uh, key SDG in our projects, and we'll discuss that further. But that's, that's what CIFI da, uh, does, and that's the, that's the contribution to, to, to the SDGs and the projects. Thanks so much, Cesar. Uh, super interesting. I wanted to, to bring Joan into the conversation, and then I want to circle back um, actually to, to you and Andrew um, in just a moment, uh, talking about uh, talking about uh, is there a trade-off um, between you both spoke to commercial viability um, and development impact, and so really curious to hear from both of you on is there a trade-off between commercial viability and development impact. So I'll let you think about that, uh, but first I wanted to, to bring Joan into the conversation. So Joan, uh, you run uh, a blended finance network, actually you well, you run the Blended Finance Network Convergence. Um, I'm so pleased that you are a member of FinDev Canada's Advisory Council, and I've benefited greatly from your advice since I joined as CEO in June of last year. Uh, you also know Andrew um, from Climate Fund Managers. Uh, you supported some of their initial work, so Convergence supported some of their initial work, which is really great to hear. Um, but first of all, to kick things off, in case not everyone knows about Convergence, could you tell us a little bit more about what Convergence does uh, and help the audience appreciate what is blended finance, what Andrew was talking about, and what the role you think it plays in the sustainable infrastructure space? Thanks. And yes, it's been wonderful to be on your advisory council. So that has given me a great view into um, your work as you've gotten from zero to where you are today, which is very far along, just a couple of short years. So congrats. Um, let me break this down a little bit. So blended finance, I used to have to define it all the time because nobody ever heard of it, but it's kind of become mainstream. But just to recap real, really briefly, what it is is the strategic or you could say careful use of concessional money, catalytic money, um, whatever your favorite adjective is, to draw in private sector capital in support of the SDGs. And we focus on the emerging markets. Um, these are transactions that would not have happened without some kind of um, financial engineering that includes um, catalytic money. So blended finance is a structuring approach, not a philosophy. You can have an impact deal that's you know, blended finance or an infrastructure deal. It is just a way of structuring different kinds of money to get transactions done that wouldn't have otherwise happened. And those transactions can be funds like um, Andrew's fund, or they can be specific projects or companies even, or bonds. So that's blended finance. What we do is we operate as the global network for blended finance, and we put out data on the field. We put out market insights. And we also try very hard to support actual transactions that need to close to get things done. And we do that in two forms. We operate as a membership. So our members can um, post transactions on our site and we try to give them as much uh, visibility as we can and um, hopefully get our membership talking about these transactions uh, to support them. And the second thing we do has nothing to do with membership. We receive grant resources that we then award to practitioners who are trying to get transactions 
to market, but they're at concept stage. They're very early. Nobody's yet ready to invest in them. And without a bit of financial support, the transaction would never advance to the point where folks like FinDev or private sector companies could invest in them. Um, so in the realm of, uh, of field building and, and, and data, we have captured trans, uh, information on about, I would say on just under 700 transactions in the past decade or so. We've tried to catalog them and observe them and, and feed that information back to the field. A very good resource for everyone is our State of Blended Finance 2021, which maps the field and comments on where the major gaps are, which we might wanna come back to. Um, so what we know uh, so far is we've been able to document about $160 billion worth of transactions, like I said, just under 700 um, deals. Um, and two very big sectors are energy and financial services. When you strip energy out of infrastructure, it's a pretty small fraction of uh, the field of blended finance. And I think that is uh, in large part because a lot of infrastructure transactions can go ahead without any element of concessionality. They can be structured in a way so that um, you know, they are investable. Um, but when you get to uh, difficult regions or countries or difficult sectors like water and wastewater, you start to see more blended transactions. So um, if you look at blended infrastructure deals, you will notice that many of them are in sub-Saharan Africa, um, which is not, I think, the pattern for infrastructure writ large. Uh, blended infrastructure transactions tend to be blended at the project level, not at the fund level. So what Andrew and his crew are doing is important because it takes that painstaking work of blending you know, getting a donor and a commercial investor to work together, it takes it from that one by one project kind of work up to a level where you do the blending systemically once, twice, or three times in one, two, or three buckets as, as his structure does. And then that money is available. So as individual infrastructure transactions come along, you're not reinventing the mix every time you have what you need you know, you have all the flavors of paint you need to make to paint the canvas, if, if you want to say it that way. Um, so what we see in infrastructure is a lot of project level blending. We would like to see it taken up one level. We would like to see it at a larger scale. Um, and there is a role for blending in infrastructure, but there's we hope to see it evolve from where it is today. I'll stop there. There's a lot more to say, but I want to yield back the microphone for the rest of the conversation. Thanks so much, Joan. And, and you actually set up a, a question that I'd like to I'd like to ask you later about what you view is the uh, role of blended finance in the future of infrastructure. So we'll come back to that. But I wanted to pick up on um, the super interesting uh, conversation that we just had with uh, Cesar and Andrew. Uh, coming, you're both looking, you know, in your in your investment models for commercial returns. Um, yet you're having huge uh, and significant development impacts. So just very briefly, do you view that there's a trade-off? Off between commercial returns and development impacts, or can they go hand in hand? Uh, Cesar, let's start with you first. Yeah, and um, yes, and, and, and it's very interesting, John, because um, I think blended finance is more common in Africa than I've seen that in Latin America. I have, I have seen a tremendous need for blended finance in the use of new technology because uh, as, as we move to more sustainable projects, we need to uh, we need to keep in mind that maybe new technology uh, are, are needed uh, for these projects. And we as lenders, sometimes we wanna see uh, a performance track record of that technology uh, uh, and, and, and the level of financing that we can provide to a new technology or to a new project is not the same as if we know the performance of that technology for a, for, for a 10, 20 years period. So that blended finance, I think is very, very useful and very, very needed to uh, make sustainable projects more bankable because lenders need that, uh, you know, that, that comfort that the projects run by the private sector, if they use new technology or maybe the economics are not that uh, clear, 
the blended finance plays a key key role. Yeah. Thanks so much, Cesar. Andrew, over to you. Um, just curious yeah. about your experience on, on uh, commercial returns and development impact. Can they go hand in hand? Absolutely. So, Laurie, in our, in our view, they, these are two very positively correlated themes. You know, they do go hand in hand. In fact, um, conversely, a project that doesn't actually have impact, we would rate as a much higher project, a higher risk project. Um, in terms of its its longevity. Now, to put it into context, when, when one spends money on infrastructure, the useful life of the real asset spans you know, generations. It's 20, 30-year assets. So they really do need to remain. They do need to continue to perform to enable them to actually repay the funding that's required to actually build in the first place. For it to perform, it needs to be relevant. And it needs to be relevant to the people who are the beneficiaries of the asset. And so that relevance is really what impact is all about. And so we seek to measure, firstly, the direct impact and the, be and the benefit that that asset is creating right through the structure, right from GDP support, you know, the high level stuff that people read about that don't really sort of, don't really experience on a day-to-day -day basis, all the way through to the day-to-day -day impact that the investment and that bit of infrastructure has on the communities. Equally importantly, Laurie, that, that impact needs to be vibrant. It needs to keep on refreshing itself. It needs to keep on repurposing itself because the community and the environment in which that asset exists does continue to evolve, nothing static. So what impact means when you build it in year one may well mean something different in, five, in year five, in year 10, in year 15. So, so the, the concept and the ethic of impact and how it manifests is as important because that endures then the actual impact itself on day one. And you've got to keep on revitalizing that and you've got to embed that in the DNA and you've got to make sure there's capital available and, and the ethic of the actual asset sustains that momentum. So it's a very, very central part of the way, not only do we see it because we, we climate impact orientated, but as pure investment people, they are two indivisible concepts. Thanks so much, Andrew. Love, love, love your reflections on that. And obviously, it's it's music to our ears. FinDev Canada is all about enhancing, enhancing, and deepening development impacts for people and planet. So, if you if you don't mind, let's continue on that impact theme. Turning to yep. an important part of that sustainability lens that I referenced at the outset. So at FinDev Canada, we are committed to analyzing the gender impacts of in the projects that we finance. And that analysis leads us to identify areas where we can work and where we can support our clients to help them increase their impact on gender equality and that sustainability theme. So let me go back again to, to Cesar and, and Andrew. Uh, what has been your experience in working with the FinDev Canada team and helping CIFI, in, in the case of Cesar, and helping CIFI integrate gender analysis into your operations? And how has this gender lens flowed through to the clients that you support? Thank you, Laurie. Yes, CIFI has gender equality very high in its agenda. And actually, since uh, FinDev became lender of CIFI, in 2020, we have had a close collaboration with FinDEP uh, and the teams from FinDEP and, and CIFI have been working in, the, in, in, in getting our procedures uh, and, and also with our teams to improve our internal operations to better integrate uh, our gender strategy through engagement, training, mentorship. And also we have revised our procedures to force the clients to uh, coach our clients to do the same thing. In our sector, as you can imagine, infrastructure and, 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 and the women participation is a big challenge, especially in Latin America. And I can tell you from the 12,000 jobs that we have created, we have only 1,500 uh, jobs related to women. It's, it's, not, it's not a significant amount, uh, and, and it's a, it shows that it still is a challenge, but the trend is better if you look back uh, a, year, a few years uh, ago. So the trend is, 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 is improving. I think it's a work in progress. Uh, we, we need to uh, also coach our clients to uh, incorporate that SDG as one com key component in, in the financing and in the projects that we finance. But as, as I say, uh, the, the, the 1,500 uh, jobs related to women is low, but is much better than the numbers that we saw a few years, a few years ago. And I'll give you an example. We are financing a biomass uh, a power plant in Argentina. We have a, very, uh, a sponsor very committed to that uh, KPI, and they uh, 
they, they incorporated a coaching training program for women. And even though that is a biomass project, the level of participation of the women community in that project has increased in the last two years. So I, I think training, engagement, uh, coaching, I think is a key uh, component to make gender equality uh, more balanced in sectors like uh, infrastructure, which is a challenge. Thanks so much, Cesar. And the, the commitment of CFI to gender equality is clear. And thanks for sharing those that kind of real life, uh, real life examples that you're experiencing. Yeah. Really appreciate that. Um, Andrew, let me ask, ask you the same question. How do you factor in gender considerations in the funds that you've created? And how does that flow through to, to help your clients? So Laurie, um, uh, I'll, I'll get into the specifics, but I'd also like to maybe if I respond to the question you proposed to Cesar, which is what, where, do, where does Finde fit into the, um, our, our, our journey? Um, and there are two things I think Finde have kind of done for us. One is a contribution of, of acute awareness of the issue. And I'm gonna unpack that a little bit and also provided tools. You know, once we're aware to give us the tools. Now, um, clearly the, the, the gender challenge in emerging markets, everybody's aware of that because it's so apparent. What I think is not that apparent is that what we do in the world of financing and engineering, you know, once you start looking, you suddenly realize just how non-gender balanced it actually is um, for all sorts of historic reasons. You think, wow. So that comes from the awareness. Then you start looking and think, okay, well, let's start looking about closer home. And so we look within the CFM and say, well, how do we actually build an organization that's, that's aware? Um, in doing that, with the assistance of yourselves and your experts, we've put policies together, we've done internal training, we have made ourselves aware before we could become the disciples of gender awareness and gender equality and gender mainstreaming. Let's understand it, let's learn it, let's walk the talk, or talk the walk. Um, and that's what we did, We're very much with your assistance. So then we've now go down at the project level. And we implement that now in terms of how we implement projects, positive recruitment, positive training, as well as collaterally into our, into our community development programs that I mentioned earlier on. So I think the main, the main benefit is that broadly speaking, we're dealing with, with, with aware, awareable and educated people. The key is making them aware. You make them aware, point them in the right direction, then, and with a bit of nudging, they tend to end up to end up heading in the right direction. And I think that's what, that's what you've done with us, and we've kept that momentum going. And it runs centrally throughout through the business, our recruitment policies, our implementation, and and our and our legacy programs that we leave on the ground. Thanks so much, Andrew. And it goes without saying, but I'll say it, it's our absolute pleasure to support you in the in the gender journey, just like uh, just like Cesar and, and Sifi. Uh, so thank you for those kind words. Joan, let me come back to you. Um, what, uh, what role does sort of gender have in the blended finance um, space or does it? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to jump in. Um, I don't think this is a blended finance uh, pattern. I think it's a broader pattern that we're noticing when we look at the blended finance data. But I just wanted to, to comment that we went back and looked at all the historical transactions that we have recorded that people have done. Um, and when we look at the infrastructure subset, uh, there's a fair degree of impact reporting. And that doesn't surprise me because these are transactions that typically have a fairly close, either an adjacent or a partnership relationship with governments and, and um, development banks. And so the fact that there's reporting to the public doesn't surprise me. But what is disappointing is that the number of transactions uh, that we see where gender disaggregated reporting shows up is kind of slim, even as compared to our overall blended finance data. So um, I would like to see more gender disaggregated impact reporting going forward in, in, the, in the infrastructure sector. So as I said, I don't think that's because it's blended. I think that's just in the infrastructure sector, gender disaggregated reporting probably hasn't been a thing the way it probably should be. And any question that you don't ask and don't examine becomes a risk. So I also wanted to endorse what Andrew and Cesar were talking about, about how it strengthens your, your business performance and your resiliency if you know the answer to some questions on the gender front. Um, but I just noticed that in the data and it was kind of disappointing. 
Very well said, Joan. That's a really great observation, and we'll certainly continue to, to push on the reporting angle. I think it's a really important uh, aspect to, to remind us all. So thank you so much for, for bringing that up. Um, let's, let's shift a little bit for now. Um, we could easily talk about barriers to investing in sustainable infrastructure in emerging markets, but let's shift our attention to opportunities that, that you see. Uh, Cesar, as someone looking to source deals in this space, what do you see as opportunities Opportunities in the LAC region? Do you see the emergence of increasing opportunities in spite of the impacts of COVID-19 or do you see your pipeline shrinking? So tell us a little bit about the, the opportunities, if you will. Well, Laurie, I think uh, the COVID had an impact on everyone. And also I think on the number of projects that you see outside. And um, yeah, from the pandemic, we have seen a uh, reduced number of deals uh, in the region. But uh, late uh, in 2020, I think we have seen also an activation of uh, new, uh, new projects coming to a, a phase where they are looking for financing. And it's very, uh, it's very obvious that the COVID also brought lockdowns. We could not, or sponsors could not get the license, the permits to get the projects ready to build. So I think that was a very natural stop that we uh, faced. Um, now, in, in, starting in 2022, we have an active pipeline. We, we are seeing a, a much more level of activity. We closed a, a, a good number of deals in 2021 still, but it's not the same level of number of projects that we uh, are used to see before COVID and not, that we are seeing right now. Sectors where we are very active is green energy, we are starting to look at more uh, waste management, water and sanitation. I think that's a very important sector where we'll see uh, more opportunities and the private sector needs to be much more involved in this, uh, in this, uh, in this SDGs, one of the SDGs, water, clear, clear water and sanitation. Uh, also after the COVID telecommunications, you know, I think after the COVID or during the COVID, we have realized that we need to be communicating even uh, from our homes or from everywhere we are. So communication is key to, to, uh, to have that service in rural areas for the kids to uh, attend the school online or to, for us to work wherever we are. So we are investing, uh, lending to a few telecom projects in the region. Uh, also social infrastructure, education and health. You know, that's another sector where we have seen a pickup in the number in the number of deals and clients calling us. So uh, I think after the COVID, infrastructure is a sector that has to be considered as a as a good motor for uh, for the recovery. Private sector is needed. A few sectors that are looking very interesting and uh, and and yeah and 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 and, this, and the activity picking up a little bit now. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Cesar. And I like your the the looking at the opportunities and and that it's uh, so important in this space uh, going forward going forward in Latin America and the Caribbean. But that can be sort of extrapolated for the the rest of the the developing world as well. Um, Andrew, let me come to you and ask you the same question. Looking broadly at the sustainable infrastructure sectors, where do you see opportunities? And I'm actually going to pose a second question to you that came in from um, the audience. So when you're looking sort of at the future um, future opportunities. Uh, from Climate Investor 1 to Climate Investor 2, how did the composition of investors, particularly the overall interest from commercial investors, change after having built your proof of concept through uh, Climate Investor 1? So is there any lessons learned or the evolution from CI1 to CI2? Maybe you can talk about that as you're, as you're speaking towards opportunities. Okay, great question, great question. All right. So in respect to the first one, there are really three areas that we see opportunities um, in the mitigation space. And these are this little climate narrative and in the mitigation space, firstly, in the ad adaptation space and in the energy transition space. In the mitigation space, broadly speaking, infrastructure is decentralizing, getting smaller. It's following what happened with cell phones. So it's moving into bite size um, owner user bits of infrastructure. So panels are moving from utility scale to people's houses. 
Um, big water treatment works are going from big utility scale really down to rural rural borehole treatment work. So disaggregation of infrastructure, more access to rural communities, that's sort of where the, the mitigation type of infrastructure is going. But at the same time, there's an awareness and what that's enabling people to do is to stop polluting by change of behavior. But at the same time, there's a huge opportunity within the adaptation space. You know, climate change is going to happen despite what we do today. So we've got to adapt um, communities and humanity to deal with the consequence of that. And that comes in the form of water scarcity. It's going to be a huge issue. Um, so uh, treating water, water reuse, industrial waste water. Cesar spoke to about municipal solid waste, you know, treatment of trash, lots of water stuck in that. So adaptation is a big component, as is resilient infrastructure. So all the stuff we built, thinking that it was going to last 30 years, well, it's probably not, because it's hotter, it's wetter, and real assets fall apart, you know, quicker in those type of conditions. So the maintenance costs are going to go up in that there's a funding opportunity. Um, and then energy transition, you know, the, the enormity of, of transitioning off fossil onto an alternative, be that, um, be that hydrogen, probably hydrogen, that's going to retool most of the world's infrastructure. Um, and a lot of that's also going to happen in the emerging markets. So these are the big themes that we position our business within. And with the development fund, we have the opportunity to actually be part of the thought leadership as well as this creation of these opportunities, which elegantly leads me into the second question was, what is the evolution? Well, our evolution really was to come up with a financing model that we could, uh, in a serial manner, deploy into the more challenging markets because the big elephants are out there, but we actually haven't currently got the tools to, to hunt them, excuse the terminology. Um, so what we so, so what we what we sought to do, um, <laughs> speaking for Africa, um, <laughs> what we sought to do was actually get a, a blended finance financing model directed at a asset class that people were largely comfortable with. And as Joan says, renewable energy is well known. You know, the moving parts are known. And that's what Cloud Investor One was. Why blended? Well, because we're doing it in seriously tough places. We're going to the Nigerias, the Djiboutis, the Vietnam, the Indonesias. Um, and so to, to use blended finance to take commercial investors into those more difficult, challenging markets, that's the role of blended finance played in Climate Investor One. But having then established the legitimacy of the vehicle, as well as the investor community, we then dialed into a much more challenging market. So Climate Investor Two is focused on water and oceans. Um, answer the question, who are the investors? Well. Uh, in large part, they're the first people, the, fir the first group of investors, the commercial investors who have come with us on that journey because they see the benefit of, of blended finance. They see the risk-adjusted return attractiveness, and they see the fundamental appeal of investing in these markets because of the impact and the sustainability characteristics that derive from that. Um, the, the private sector market, where the trillions still sit, are still inherently conservative legislation prescribed that they be conservative, you know, rating models prescribed that they be conservative. So what blended, what blended finance is trying to do is to take that conservatism, conservatism and bubble wrap it with sort of a, a, a risk um, buffer ecosystem to get them into markets that they find that it's actually not that scary and then they'll do more of it. So, so there is a theory of change underpinning it and, we, and, and we're seeing the success of that. Climate Investor One uh, closed at its first fund at $400 million. Climate Investor 2 was 675. So there in itself is a, is a validation of the, of the, of the trajectory. Um, and Climate Investor 3 and 4 will follow suit and we'll take this vehicle and go into the much more challenging areas um, like energy transition and hydrogen and ultimately resilient cities. You know, the, 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 the Uber challenge of, um, of these mega cities, which are going to arise in these challenging markets and we've got to and we've got to do something on the infrastructure climate side for that excellent thank you so much i, I love hearing from you and, and hearing from cesar in, in very different geographies but there's opportunity opportunities abound um for for private investment in, in sustainable infrastructure so that's that's really Absolutely. a great note to to lead into a question for joan so from what we've heard with all of these opportunities joan and what you're seeing um from where you sit in the blended uh, finance space 
do you view that there's an even greater role for blended finance going forward? Um, what's the relationship with, with COVID? Is there more need for blended finance going forward? And I'll also throw in a second question for you that came from the audience in that um, we'd love to hear from you on your views of multilateral development banks um, using blended finance and what's the role of multilateral development banks and DFIs in using blended finance. Um, the answer to both could almost be merged. So uh, there is a whole lot more blended finance activity that should be happening that is not yet happening. It is still at a cottage industry and it needs to be really ramped up. Uh, in our state of blended finance report for 2021, we pointed out several reasons why blended finance is not operating at scale. One of them is that uh, on the donor side, the, the biggest source of concessional capital are the uh, the donors, the government uh, donors who who have aid budgets and are you know in the business of trying to um, help other economies, so that is a binding constraint. And a lot of that donor money goes into multilateral development banks and is uh, entrusted to them to go ahead and do transactions that they feel that they can't do without blending. Uh, so. In the future, one of the things we would like to see is that when multilateral development banks are using concessional resources, that they are not only using it to get into places where they too are uncomfortable, but they are also reaching behind them and saying, how can I get other people's money into this transaction? Can I potentially shape it in a way, uh, to Andrew's point, there are institutional investors who are not mandated to take enormous risks, can actually find a place in that transaction. So one of the things we note in our report is that the donors don't have a strategy for getting that done and we would like to see that happen. And if they did, I think the multilateral development banks uh, could also be pressured to and also have a strategy to invite other folks into their transactions as an objective and not just when it happens. Um, Blended finance and infrastructure generally, you know, I was thinking about this and it appears in two modes. One is at the front end of a transaction that the concessional money comes in first and tries to lay a path for a transaction to happen. So you might see concessional money being used for project development uh, for very high risk places, uh, parts, parts of the life cycle where there may not be a return. Um, and the other place where you see blended, where you see concessional resources pop up in infrastructure transactions and make them blended is in the capital structure itself when the transaction happens. Um, so uh, one comment I wanted to make, uh, the climate finance partnership structure is really smart in that phasing. Uh, we wrote a case study on Climate Investor One that's available on our website that diagrams how they've structured the concessional resources to be very heavy on the front end and lighter as you go into the parts of a project, they're kind of safer for people to invest in. Um, so, so blended finance can be used, sorry, concessional resources can be used in the front end of a project. They can also be used in the capital stack. And why and, and what's the opportunity for blended finance? Well, there are two things that it can cure for. One is inherently high risk. You're in a country, in a sector, um, where the regulator's skill is unknown, where the political environment can't be projected 20 years forward, and where as sort of a result of those two things, the foreign exchange environment is pretty scary as well. You don't know if your investment will yield when you convert it back into hard dollars or pounds or whatever at the end. Um, so blended finance structures can begin to address some of those risks. They also are useful in places where an asset is just frankly too expensive for the place where it's needed, where you need a water treatment plant, but the inherent tax base of that country and the income level of that country can't quite afford that asset that it actually needs. Um, and then you can see blended transactions where the capital cost is bought down or the operating cost is bought down with the concessional resources that appear in the transaction itself, not ahead of time, but in the transaction itself. So those are places where blended finance can be used and has been used. And we would really like to see it scaled up so that it becomes sort of something that people know how to do more often. And part of that scaling up is to get the blend to happen, as I said earlier, up at an aggregate level and not one by one by one in every mm -hmm. transaction that, that, that goes forth. 
Thanks so much, Joan. Really, really insightful con uh, comments. And I want to uh, pivot on the question that was asked by the audience about the role of uh, development finance institutions and, and multilateral development banks, whether it's with blended finance as a, as a solution or um, whether it's uh, with our own balance sheet. Um, taking a look at where kind of overall financing comes from, FinDev Canada joins other DFIs and MDBs as an important source of finance and investment in emerging markets. Um, we open up new markets for private investments. We typically go in before private uh, investors and financiers have an appet appetite to do so. Um, and we tend to provide long-term finance and risk mitigation tools to stimulate private investment that carries with it significant development impacts as we've been talking about today. Um, yet, if we're able, if we if we are hopeful at delivering on the Sustainable Development Goals and Paris Agreement commitments and make a dent in that $1.5 trillion infrastructure investment gap that I referenced earlier, we really need to leverage large amounts of capital from private investors. And this goes a little bit to what you were saying, Joan. Um, so I'd, I'd love to hear particularly from Andrew and, and Cesar at the outset, um, what, ex what have been your experiences in mobilizing uh, private capital uh, since that is really the, the tough nut to crack, as they say. Andrew, let's, let's start with you. So Laurie, um, the first word that springs to mind is, is one of trust. The blended finance requires an enormous amount of trust uh, from the participants. It, it, it requires all the investors to move slightly off their mainstream um, and accommodate the a blended outcome, a, a, a blended aspiration. There needs to be a very single and clear purpose for everybody to rally around. And climate does provide that or development could provide that. Um, but it does require every organization to shift slightly from what their, what their normal uh, business model is. And, and the most frequent response we get when we go and uh, fundraise is, you know, it doesn't quite fit in the box. And we say, yeah, we know that. Now, now what, 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 what gives people to move outside of the box? Well, it's trust. It's trust in the, in the structure. It's trust in the co-investors. And it's trust in the manager. But coming back to the second point, and this is the role of the DFIs, is that the DFIs play a vitally important role of being that, being that nexus between the private sector and the public sector because they're a bit of a hybrid of the two. And both trust that organizational nature and the people within it and so they really are the trust agents in blended finance. I can't, I can't see a blended finance structure, certainly not in my experience anyway, that, that, that doesn't work without that catalytic DFI or DFI community in the middle of it. That's my, that's my key learnings to date. Thanks so much, Andrew. And Cesar, maybe turning to you as well, um, CFI hasn't used blended finance sort of heretofore. So curious about your experience um, with mobilizing private capital. Thank you, Laurie, and I fully agree with what Andrew said, you know, trust, confidence, track record, everything. But in addition to that, I, I will say that there is money outside. Uh, I think, uh, you know, good projects can mobilize money. We uh, also evolved from uh, getting money from DFIs, multilaterals to the capital markets. We moved to the region. We, uh, we, we, we. We were uh, known by the investors in the local capital markets, and we have seen a very good response from the capital markets. That's why I'm saying that there is money out, there is money outside that can be mobilized. And also there are a good number of institutional investors looking for responsible investments. Uh, those investments that are in, in, in projects that we are talking about today, sustainability, impact, uh, you know, these projects that are a few out there uh, have a good appetite for investors that are looking these kind of deals. So there is money outside, they, it can be mobilized. They have to meet uh, all the boxes that Andrew said, uh, and, 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 and it's, a, it's, a, it's increasing the number of money and the investors that are looking for these good projects to put money in. Thanks so much, Cesar. I wanted to uh, uh, pivot from what you've just mentioned and come back to Joan um, uh, now. So Joan, you mentioned that um, there's a, blended finance has become sort of more mainstream and that there's calls to scale up blended finance. So tell us, is it a myth that private capital is reluctant to invest in sustainable infrastructure or invest in developing uh, countries unless capital is blended with concessional finance. How far can we stretch that, uh, that argument? Is blended finance sort of the, the end all be all? No, <laughs> uh, 
Short answer, no. Uh, there's lots and lots of infrastructure that happens every day, even in challenging markets that is done in purely commercial terms. There's an offtake contract, there's a EPC contract, there's a PPA, there's just the usual standard stuff and it happens and it happens uh, solidly. Um, and whenever you blend, that is whenever you introduce money that's there to buy impact and not hunting for commercial returns with money that needs a commercial return, that trust issue pops up, the complex, complexity issue pops up. So I would say one myth is that the private sector is hunting for cheap capital and will enter into that complexity uh, willingly. I think private sector investors prefer not to blend and they prefer to deal with nice clean market principles and get on with it. Uh, so they blend when they need to. And similarly development actors blend and they're probably pretty uncomfortable many times with finance, but they blend when they realize that the scale of what we're trying to solve for is just so mammoth as compared to the resources at their disposal. So lots happens without blended finance. Um, where blended finance is useful is, uh, like I said, in, in the sectors that aren't necessarily um, as well known to be commercial. So when you get into wastewater, solid waste, um, in places that have turbulence, political turbulence, regulatory turbulence. Uh, and, you know, one of you, I think it was Andrew mentioned earlier, maybe when we get into technology risk in the future, I haven't seen blending used for that very often, but maybe that's the future. But Commercial investors will do lots without blending. Blending is only one thing in the toolkit. Obviously, other things in a toolkit are capacity building for regulators, um, you know, other solutions that deal with foreign exchange risks, such as motivating local investors. There are all sorts of other tools to be used. So blending is useful, as I said a little while ago, when there are excess risks um, or possibly when uh, an asset that is needed is just unaffordable at the moment that it's needed and you need to have some kind of introduction of it uh, with operating costs or capital costs reduced. Thanks so much, Joan. Um, super, again, super interesting insights. Uh, those joining us today have asked uh, some questions via chat. I've been able to get to a couple of them. We might not get to all of them. So one of our team members will certainly follow up to answer anything that is left unanswered. Um, but let me, let me ask another question. Andrew, this comes to you. Um, here's the question. Uh, Latin America has offshore regulated funds, which might increase the appetite of private capital investors in this region. Andrew, do you see similar funds in Africa in the future? Oh, oh, um, a challenging question. Um, I would say no, um, unfortunately. Um, I, th I, think th I think there was an era of offshore regulated funds through Mauritius, and Mauritius for a long period of time was in fact the offshore portal to invest into Africa. There is a a, a global, clamp, uh, not clamping down, but but awareness of um, base cost shifting from a tax perspective, which is appropriate that each jurisdiction should have a sustainable tax base. And so structures that used to be effectively tax driven tax stru uh, structures are now being unpicked. And really the, the conduit between the investor to the origins of the asset is trying to be as direct as possible. And I think that is that is, is a as a trend and a theme that's probably not going to reverse any time soon. Um, I think to the extent that there are offshore structures to aggregate capital, and there are legitimate reasons to aggregate capital. In some instances, you want to pool capital in a certain jurisdiction in which you can then attach something like a political risk insurance in aggregate around that pool of capital before you deploy it into the jurisdiction. Then those type of structures, but they'll be very, very, very bespoke. Um, if you look at funds like ourselves, they are aggregation vehicles. Uh, our, fu our funds are based in the Netherlands. They, they are, they are um, corporate company entities. Uh, and so there will be those type of structures, absolutely. Um, but I think that these, these structures of Mauritius, Caymans, Virgin Islands and the likes, I think we'll see less of this going forward. Um, I think the other final thing, just to augment, I think your, your last question is, the role of blended finance. The way we see it is that the world is probably getting is, is probably getting riskier as we go forward. There are greater unknowns driven very much by the climate variability that's coming into our existence. And with that, you need capital that's more risk tolerant. So 
we think of it as sort of four by four capital. They need to have bigger wheels. They need to have more res resilient shock absorbers to get over the bumps because it's more bumpy terrain ahead. And that I think is what blended finance is. Blended finance is like the four by four of uh, structured finance. I love that analogy. That's amazing. Um, unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today. I think we were just getting into some really uh, meaty and juicier questions coming from the audience. Um, but I would like to thank our panelists, Andrew, Cesar, and Joan for so generously sharing with us your knowledge, your experience, and your insights. This has been an excellent conversation, and I'm sure the audience has taken as much away from this as I have. I'd also like to thank our audience for taking time out of your day to join us online. As I said, any questions we did not get to, we'll follow up and, and get back to you with answers. And we'll also send everyone who participated a brief survey. We'd love your feedback so that we can improve going forward. And with that, wishing everyone a great rest of day. Enjoy the ongoing programming as part of International Development Week. Goodbye, and thank you very, very much. <laughs>